All right, guys. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, we will be addressing your questions on the quiz today. Um, oh, and we are not changing the schedule per se. That was from last year. Get rid of that. There we go. Um, and we'll talk about um, basically how resonance affects acid and base strength, as well as some of the other variables that can be involved. And we'll talk about solubility. So basically going over some of the concepts from lab last week um, from the extraction section in particular that uh, you know we're, we're really giving people some trouble. Um, this was already in the schedule to go over that again, so you guys can really get a, get a handle on on um, that side of things. Um, first off, random quiz questions. Um, somebody asked if organic chemistry is used to make drugs, and why are there side effects to drugs? Can't chemicals be paired in a manner that would make them perfect for the desired purpose? Short answer: No, um, because you're even if you can make a very pure chemical that can be used for a therapeutic or recreational purpose, um, basically the body is too complicated for that. When you're, when you, um, when you administer any drugs that have any um, psychotropic effects, they're basically going to always affect a concentration of neurotransmitters in one way or another, usually dopamine or serotonin. Um, but the the problem with that is that the concentration of all of your neurotransmitters in your brain is all tied together. So you can't affect one of them without affecting the others. Their structures are too similar to each other. Um, and they're, they're related in various, various equilibrium reactions. And so if you change the concentration of dopamine, for example, you're also going to change the concentration of adrenaline and noradrenaline, which have, which can do things like trigger fight or flight response and, you know, elevated heart rate or sweating. Um, so there's basically because the body is one giant equilibrium system, you can't change anything in, in that, the body without affecting other, um, other systems in the body. Uh, somebody asked about, um, whether natural medicinal compounds are, are any different than, than a synthetic compound. Um, not really. Natural, the way it's used in, um, in uh, marketing for medications and supplements basically means that it comes from a natural source, meaning that they're, they're, um, if you're going to buy natural salicylic acid as for use as a pain relief, um, they mean they're actually going to extract it from a natural product like willow bark or something along those lines. Um, that a synthetic source is going to still be the exact same molecule, just from a different source. You're synthesizing it in a lab rather than extracting it from a natural product, um, which frequently the natural, the natural compounds are going to be um, might have more side effects because they will frequently have other um, compounds mixed in depending on the extraction process. Um, but they're not any weaker or stronger. In fact, there are lots of natural compounds that are really, really bad for you. you know, arsenic's a natural compound. Um, and it doesn't matter whether that's coming from an organic or an inorganic source, that's going to kill you. Um, so it's, important to to remember that natural is not a word that it's don't fall into what's called the naturalistic fallacy just because something occurs in nature or comes from a natural source does not make it any stronger weaker safer or more dangerous um, than anything from a synthetic source um, synthetic just means you made it in a, in a lab there's a little bit of a difference between um, organic and synthetic because organic means it occurs in nature and synthetic when it's used in contrast with um, with organic means it's a compound that does not occur in nature. And so those can be, a, those are going to be very different because it will not be the same compounds in both of those um, instances. 
Um, but again, doesn't necessarily mean they're any better or worse for you. Just means just is telling you about where they came from. Last but not least, since I thought I'd tackle all these since they're all related to somewhat. Um, how does our body make neurotransmitters? Um, they're actually, for the most part, the, the primary neurotransmitters like, like dopamine, serotonin, adrenaline, noradrenaline, um, they're all only a few atoms different from, from amino acids that are used in protein synthesis in your body. So usually what will happen is I believe most of them start from um, phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is if you remove the carboxylic acid group from it and you add a couple OHs here and there, um, you make dopamine. If you add an extra OH, um, you can turn dopamine into, into noradrenaline. And if you remove a different OH, you wind up make, turning noradrenaline into adrenaline. So they all wind up being pretty small changes from, from compounds that are naturally present in the diet um, and in cells. So they are made from nutrients for the most part. I believe serotonin is made from tryptophan. Um, start, start by just removing carboxylic acid group from tryptophan and then again, add an OH in the right spot and you'll wind up making serotonin. Um, which in theory is why tryptophan was, was blamed for making people sleepy after, after uh, Thanksgiving dinner um, was because it's you in theory, we're adding more tryptophan to your diet, um, made it so that you would have more serotonin, but would also create you um, some other um, neurotransmitters like melatonin and make you feel sleepy. Really, that's just a food coma. You can't actually eat anything um, natural that's going to have going to have that high uh, um, concentration of tryptophan to really notice a difference there. Um, somebody else asked some good questions. These are actually really similar to questions people were asking, um, a couple people asked in Gen Chem um, that oddly enough, these weren't questions that I had really considered before. Excuse my cat. Um, the, what are the, what's the best way to study for organic chemistry in particular was one that I had to stop and think um, and try and remember what it was like when I was in OCHEM um, I, I had the best results and I think most of my students have the best results when you basically spend the time um, sort of immersing yourself in trying to think about organic chemistry in a um, sort of all-encompassing all way. Don't try to treat it like it's a where you can compartmentalize and just memorize various skills all of organic chemistry is only going to be a few skills used over and over again. Um, and especially we're talking about basically resonance and electronegativity. Almost everything can come back to those two things. And so if you really spend the time trying to understand resonance and electronegativity and stability, um, that's really going to help. There are going to be some parts where you're not quite there yet. Like when we take a midterm, you probably are not going to have enough experience that you can just go into it, you know, blind, having just thinking, oh, it's going to be electronegativity and resonance. You guys aren't going to have enough practice by the midterm to be able to do that. So there's probably going to be some, um, a little bit of memorization. And while you're trying to wrap your head around how all of these different reactions are related to those concepts, um, but basically keep keep working at it and and almost everybody who really spends the time in organic chemistry will have um what what we call a, an aha moment a eureka moment where all of a sudden things will click and you'll and it's not going to mean that you are going to automatically like it's not going to be like um you know a beautiful mind where you're going to start writing on your windows with with markers and stuff like that and just start seeing seeing everything in terms of code or something like that um but it's just gonna say everything is gonna start making more sense when i present new reactions like oh that really is the same reaction that we've already learned three times the first three times you learn it it's gonna feel like three different reactions that you just have to memorize but all of a sudden they'll become some moment where like oh this is the same thing we've done three times now um so you know, my best advice is to keep sticking with it, try and 
try and stay on top of and use the textbook as well. You guys paid for this textbook, right? So let's uh, um, use it, read it. It's pretty well written and it um, for an organic chemistry textbook and it will take time to read, um, but you should be able to, um, there's no reason why any of you guys can't be really good at organic chemistry by the end of, if not this quarter, next quarter. Right. I know life happens. It's really hard to stay on top of things, but um, we will keep working towards that. And with that in mind, um, I also might ramble a little bit and be a little incoherent at times today because I didn't get much sleep tonight. I don't know if any of you guys have um, siblings or kids at uh, LTUSD school district, um, but they announced tonight or last night that they're totally changing their distance learning model for kids. Now that we're, you know, four weeks in and actually starting to get a, a routine going, they decided they're going to change all that. Um, and so I didn't sleep much last night because my wife and I were trying to figure out how the heck we're going to get our son to first grade in person for two days a week, but then do it entirely homeschool for three days a week. Um, and they're not very, very flexible with pickup and drop off times, as you might expect. Um, so I understand that that's a stressor on anybody who has kids that they're that they care about and or care for in the LTUSD system. Um, and so we'll try to be flexible with anything that goes along with that. Um, just let me know if you need to um, make any accommodations that way. Um, hey, Sean. So are they not yeah. doing? Is it? Are they not doing hybrid anymore, or they can't do like one or the other? It's like a set standard. No, because I, I, I actually I work with kids, so it kind of affects me. Yeah. No. So the what they they didn't really announce much last night. They did a whole lot of talking in circles without actually telling anything. It was a two and a half hour board meeting that they didn't actually decide anything, mm -hmm. um, other than other than teachers and parents are pissed about this, um, but they're doing it anyway. Um, so it's basically what they, what they announced was that there's going to be a group of, they're going to split all the classes in half, half of them go to school Monday, Tuesday, half of them go to school Thursday, Friday, and on Wednesday, everybody does distance learning. Um, and that's supposed to be the teacher's day to catch up and clean the classroom and sanitize between the two groups. Um, that's just for LTUSB. I don't know what other, and that's just for elementary is starting in two weeks, they're supposed to start doing that. And then for the middle school, it's, it's a couple weeks after that. And the high school is going to stay distance learning for the entire year. Um, okay. With like hybrid lab, I think labs, like similar to what we were planning on doing for the high school, where they're going to be doing everything distance except for science labs and, and shop classes and stuff will be in person. I don't know if they're going to actually follow through with that. We'll see how that actually goes and go from there. But uh, yeah, it's going to be everything's up in the air right now for LTUSD, which is not all helpful for any of us. All right. I think I talked about the other part in here too. Um, that's in the wrong window um, where we are looking at um, what are the most important foundational concepts? It's going to be electronegativity, resonance, and um, and basically we're going to track partial charges from place to place to figure out what the heck's going on with these reactions. So let's talk about the quiz questions. Most of your quiz questions had to do with this molecule which off the top of my head, I have no idea what it is anymore. That was a long time ago. I wrote this slide. Um, but that shouldn't matter for determining molecular formula, right? If we wanted to know what the compound was, we could build it in Molview, check the information card. Um, in terms of molecular formula, we want to remember our, our base rules, right? Count to four, but not five. Carbons all have four bonds. So if we're trying to, to draw the molecular formula here, um, counting carbons is not, not too bad, right? So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six from the benzene ring. One, two, three, four, five. So we're at 11, 12, 13, 14, 
15, 16, 16 carbons. I think everybody got this one right. I'm not really, um, other than maybe miscounting hydrogens, which is really the trickiest thing with these, right? Because you got to remember how many bonds everything has when it doesn't have a, um, when it does not have a uh, lone pair or, or I'm sorry, when it doesn't have a charge. So um, if we're trying to count there, there's one, two hydrogens. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. None on the on this carbon. One, two, one, two. None here, none there. We total all those up, get six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Plus that guy is explicitly drawn out, so twenty-one. All right, so just make sure you're not adding it's easy on a benzene ring, those carbons look like they should have a hydrogen like the others, but it already has four bonds. Any questions on, on molecular formula? I think you guys all have the hang of that. If you got it wrong, it was cause, just because you miscounted, but you know what you did. Sound, sounds like a, a parent thing to say, you know what you did. I'll take that tone when we talk about people that put 10 electrons on their carbons. Um, hybridization on carbons. I think you guys are getting the hang of that, really, right? If you've got one pair of pi electrons, then it's going to be sp2. So all your benzene carbons are sp sp2. All of or your carbonyl carbon over here is sp2. Everything else is going to be sp3. All your other carbons, that is. We wanted to know lone pairs. So remember that oxygen without a charge is going to be two lone pairs. Nitrogen or sorry, nitrogen without a charge is going to be one lone pair. So total of five lone pairs of which only some of them can be delocalized. So remember, so delocalized just means that it can be part of resonance, that it can participate in resonance. Um, so in order for a lone pair to participate in resonance, it needs to be in the allylic position, or in other words, adjacent to pi bonds or adjacent to a charge. So in this case, this oxygen down here at the bottom has um, one lone pair that can participate in resonance. Remember, you can never have more than one pair of electrons being part of resonance at a time. So this oxygen at the bottom has got one pair of electrons that's going to participate in resonance. It's going to be delocalized. This oxygen up at the top doesn't have any that can be delocalized. It's already got a pi bond attached to this oxygen. So these lone pairs are basically stuck where they are. They can't resonate. Um, this nitrogen, on the other hand, has all single bonds and it's in the allylic position to a pi bond. So this nitrogen's lone pair can resonate too. So there are two delocalized lone pairs. Um, these, the pi bonds are not considered delocalized lone pairs because they're pi bonds. If it's a um, pi bonds that are conjugated like that are always going to be delocalized, but we wouldn't refer to them as delocalized lone pairs. Um, so really what I was looking for with that one, if you circled those, I don't think I marked anybody wrong for circling the, the pi electrons, but we wouldn't consider them delocalized lone pairs because they're bonding electrons instead. Um, as far as the geometry or, and hybridization on these, that means that that oxygen and this nitrogen are not actually going to be sp3. If you've got lone pairs that are part of resonance, that means that those atoms are actually going to be sp2 despite the fact it looks like, when we draw the Lewis dot structure, it looks like they've got four electron groups. But because that lone pair on the nitrogen and one of the lone pairs on the oxygen are part of these resonance structures, it's, the geometry is going to be trigonal planar on both of those. 
Hey, Sean, I got, I got a question about the shapes with that. Yeah. So with like that nitrogen, if there's a lone pair, and so that one's SP3, correct? The nitrogen? Or we would, it was, it's going to be SP2 because it's got that lone pair is delocalized. And then that's, it's trigonal planar. So then if it was an actual, let's say it was an SP3, that would be trigonal parameter or par pyramidal, correct? Yeah, that would okay. be the name okay. we would use for so if, it, if it's that lone pair, it's a planar. And yes. then if it actually is something else, it's actually the pyramidal, okay. Yeah, and in fact, we can actually see the geometry change. If we, if we protonate that nitrogen, that nitrogen's got a lone pair, which means it's a, it's a, a weak base and we can protonate it. If we protonate it, we actually, see, we actually force that, that electron pair to be localized because it can't resonate anymore if it's part of a sigma bond. And so we can actually see the geometry change if we protonate this. If we put this molecule into an acidic solution, the shape of it changes and we lose the planar structure on that nitrogen. The oxygen is going to be harder to protonate, so we're not going to see that as much. Um, but that nitrogen in particular, we can actually switch back and forth between trigonal planar and trigonal pyramidal just by putting it in an acidic solution. Okay, thank you. No problem. Any other questions on these ones? Sean, just to confirm, so if there's a lone pair that's delocalized, you don't count that. It doesn't count as an electron group because it's more like a pi bond than it is like a deal, like it is than it is, um, you know, taking up space around that central atom. Gotcha. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions on this? I think I just need to practice this a little bit more. This is probably what I struggled with the most. It's the newest concept for you guys, so we'll keep working at it. Um, some, but. Somebody specifically asked about the relationship between hybridization and localization, which we kind of just talked about. If it's a localized electron, if it, um, if that lone pair is stuck in one place and can't resonate, it's an electron group, and that's gonna, it's gonna affect your geometry and your hybridization. Um, but if it's delocalized, we treat it like it's a pi bond, because it has, you have to have a unhybridized p orbital in order for those electrons to be able to move around to overlap with the pi orbitals next to them. Um, and somebody asked about um, how learning how resonance would affect acidity when it comes to ranking acids and bases, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, but the short answer is, since we just talked about protonating those um, nitrogens, is if you can if protonating something or losing a proton is going to make more resonance structures possible, then that's going to make that proton easier to pull off. So instead of talking about protonating, start talking about deprotonating. If you start from everything being protonated, usually if you pull off a hydrogen, we're going to be left with a negative charge or at least a lone pair. And that, if that lone pair or negative charge can then resonate and it couldn't when it was protonated, that's going to make it easier to get rid of that H plus. And, and we'll say all this again when we talk about acids and bases in a minute. But I just want you to think about to remember more resonance structures is more stable. So if you can pull an H plus off to make more resonance structures, that's going to be, that's going to make it easy to pull that hydrogen off. All right, because we're going to be, we're going to compare, we have less resonance. If, if all of the things being equal, if your protonated form and your deprotonated form are roughly the same stability, but your deprotonated form, you get one extra resonance structure that makes it more stable and more likely um, to be deprotonated. It makes it easier to pull that H plus off. Formatting on this one got all screwy. That's better. Um, this one gave gave people the most trouble um, because most of you were able to get the the four basic resonance structures, the three, the one that's drawn here, and then three more, um, which I'll draw out on the board here. But most of you missed something and left on your last 
on your last um, resonance structure, you left a positive charge on a carbon, which actually is a little bit less stable. So let me switch to the whiteboard here. All right, so most of you started by doing that, by that bond, and we're able to see, okay, we can move over a pair of electrons and we're gonna be left with a positive charge here. So that first resonance structure looks like this. Almost everybody got that. Now almost everybody got the next one, which would be moving that pair of electrons over. Now we're here. So that's a total of three resonance structures, all of which are, are going to be pretty close to the same, the same level of, of importance, same level of significance as far as how much they're going to contribute. The last one is, is where things get a little bit weird. So I, almost everybody, once again, drew this arrow next and wound up with this resonance structure, which is good that you got there. This one's going to be a little bit less significant than the others because we've got a positive charge right next to the oxygen here, which is going to have be a partial negative. Um, but it's still going to be roughly the same level of, of importance. But what most of you guys missed is that now we've got a positive charge next to a lone pair. And our most important thing for figuring out what the more, most significant resonance structures was is how can we fill all the valences? All these charges, all these positive charges on a carbon, that means that you've got an incomplete valence on that carbon, right? You only have six electrons on each of those carbons. And for this carbon as well. So if you put that next to a lone pair, it seems counterintuitive. And even the, I think two of you guys got this last resonance structure, which would look like this, you move a lone pair down. So out of the two lone pairs, you move one of the lone pairs down. Um, out of the two of you guys who drew this structure, one of you said it'd be the least significant because you put a positive charge on an oxygen, which is not a bad place to be thinking. Oxygen's electronegative. We normally wouldn't want a positive charge on an oxygen. That makes sense, except that what you're missing with that logic is that this fills all the valences, and that's the most important thing. So this would actually be the most significant contributor, because this is the only resonance structure where every atom has a full valence. I see a lot of nodding, which tells me that um, it's one of those things that when I say it up and do it on the board, it's, of course, that makes total sense. That was really obvious. Um, but uh, it's, it's like when you guys first started learning to do conversions back in Gen Chem, right? It was really, really easy when I was doing word problems with you on the board. And then when I gave you a blank piece of paper, everybody struggled for a while. It's one of those things we're going to get used to that, that hierarchy of what's the most important thing for these resonance structures, the most important thing is use the right number of electrons. The second most important thing is that everything has a full valence. And then you start worrying about how can I keep the formal charge low or keep the positive charge off of a, a, an oxygen. But that's less important than getting all the valences filled. All right, any other, any questions on I think that was the, all of the quiz questions, basically.
Um, anybody have any questions on and anything else from the quiz? Um, so if we gotten that problem, did that. Sorry, I, I didn't get um, a full grade, so I was trying to figure out what I did wrong. So the most common thing um, it was that that uh, resonance structure. If you if you missed one point on this, um, it basically on this I think this was four points was drawn all the resonance structures. If you if you got dark, mark down minus one, it's probably because you missed this last resonance structure. Um, and the other place that people got marked down um, was predominantly just on the um, counting number of delocalized lone pairs. Um, depending on on how you drew things, you may have drawn lone pairs on carbons that didn't have lone pairs. Um, I remember there was at least one person who wa who wanted to add lone pairs to each of these carbons that has a pi bond already. Um, that there are no lone pairs on that carbon um, because that carbon already has four bonds. And so what I just drew is actually a carbon with 10 electrons around it instead of eight, which is a big no-no, right? Cardinal sin of, of organic chemistry. Um, so if, you're, if you've got markdown points and you're not sure where, go back and look and see if you made either of those mistakes. If it's not one of those, um, check in with me at office hours or in lab and we can we can look at your specific answers. Um, but those are the most common things that people got marked down for was the delocalized electrons um, and the and that last resonance structure. I have a question. Yeah. Is it pretty common to see uh, an additional pi bond introduced with uh, resonance structures? Um, when you have lone pairs, yeah. Uh, a lot of times we will frequently see the number of pi bonds change by one when we draw resonance structures. Um, and that can go either way. If you, one of the, a pretty common molecule that actually has its own whole class of reactions that we'll talk about, I think not till the end of next quarter. Um, is called 1,3-butadiene, where you have four carbons, and you have, but you've got conjugated pi bonds here, which doesn't look like there's necessarily um, a lot of resonance structures you can have here, but my kids were playing with the whiteboard, so I lost all my markers. Um, you can, in fact, move a pair of electrons around and wind up with a resonance structure that looks like So if we redrew this, move the pi bond over, this carbon now has a negative charge, this carbon now has a positive charge. Um, it's not uncommon to see resonance structures like that where you either lose lose a pi bond and make two, you know, and change some formal charges um, or add a pi bond in order to fill a valence. It's, it's pretty common to see something like that. Um, but it's not usually going to change by more than one. If you're adding one pi bond or losing one pi bond, it's not, it's almost never going to gain two whole pi bonds or lose two whole pi bonds because all we're really doing is shuffling pairs of electrons around, right? If, if we tried to draw it, like losing both of these pi bonds, like if we tried to draw it something like this, you could conceivably call that a resonance structure, right? But that's going to result in charges that look like um, a positive charge and a positive charge and a negative charge and a negative charge. That's going to be super unstable because you have carbons with extra lone pairs right next to carbons with incomplete valences. Um, Is that just an insignificant resonance structure? We wouldn't even draw it. I, I would. I didn't even, for the most part, teach you guys about drawing things like this because they're going to be so weird and and rare if they even show up at all. Mathematically, that's just so unlikely. There is some finite possibility that you could observe the electrons and see them in that 
in those orbitals like that, but that probability is going to be so low as to be essentially zero. We're talking like it would happen one out of every 10 to the 20th atoms or molecules might look like that. One out of every 10 to the 20 is going to be close enough to zero. We're going to say it's not going to matter. And that's really what we're talking about when we t say we have insignificant um, contributions from these resonance structures. It means that, yeah, you could draw that resonance structure, but it's going to be so unlikely that we're basically going to say the odds are zero. It's like the odds of a roulette ball landing in between numbers. Like that doesn't happen. There's nothing, the house wouldn't even know what to do if that happened in the casino, right? Because it's so unlikely, it's probably never in the history of human nature happens. Um, therefore, we, you know, it's, we can basically say the odds are zero. Um, and you guys might, may or may not remember that, but that is something um, when we deal with numbers that are this big, um, we will see sometimes odds like that, which is really funny because, you know, we can talk about things like um, coal is more stable than diamonds in terms of forms for pure carbon. So in theory, at equilibrium, diamonds should all turn back into coal because that's the most stable state. Um, however, the rate law says that that happens so slowly that in theory, yes, it should happen. There should be some finite possibility of diamond turning into coal. Um, but you basically have to get beyond the time scale of the entire universe for that to happen. If, if you started with a diamond 14 billion years ago, it still would be a diamond. Maybe a few of the atoms would have turned back into coal. Maybe. Like there's a probability that that has happened, but very, very low. Um, so it's, you know, when we deal with these numbers like 10 to the 20th, that's a really big number. So we got to remember that. Yes, these things are possible, but are they significant? Less so. All right, let's do some quick review on acids. I've been, we've been using the term a little bit pretty loosely um, for the most part. So if you, if you think back to Gen Chem, we had three different concentrate or uh, definitions of acids. Um, and they all kind of have, they, they're all right. They all have their own place in chemistry where it's useful to think about them that way. Um, for instance, in water quality chemistry, um, an acid is anything that increases the concentration of H plus ions in a solution. Um, so now from, from the Arrhenius perspective, um, Arrhenius was basically treating, he was talking about these solutions from the point of view of the solution, not the molecules. This was long enough ago that most of the focus was still on the macroscopic level. This was before quantum happened. Um, Svante Arrhenius lived in the late 1800s. Uh, he was, I believe he was Swedish. Um, he was actually the first one ever to publish on global warming. Um, during the Industrial Revolution, he's like, hey, we're pumping a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere, and, I, and we know CO2 is a greenhouse gas. And he actually ran the numbers and said, the human race is producing enough CO2 that we could conceivably change the climate of the entire planet by altering CO2 concentrations. And this is back in like the 1880s. We're thinking, you know, he was in Europe. This is like post-Civil War for the U.S. that long ago. Um, and he actually postulated that it was going to be a good thing for humankind, but that's just because he was from Sweden and it's cold in Sweden. So he probably thought a couple degrees warmer was going to be a good thing. Um, and climate science wasn't even a thing yet. So they didn't really understand how tied these things all were together. But that's 140 years ago. It was first described, postulated and supported by science. So it's kind of crazy. We still have people fighting against that. But I'll leave that there. Uh, just a historical note about Svante Arrhenius. Um, Bronsted and Lowry were the first ones to put a definition of acids um, in the 
in the molecular terms, and they were basically it, they basically flipped Arrhenius's definition around. Instead of saying an acid is something that increases the concentration of H plus ions in the solution, they said that the pro, that the acid is whatever it can give away an H plus ion, something that can lose an, a proton. And so that's the most common definition for Gen Chem and for OCHEM because we're dealing with things at the molecular level. So we're less concerned with what's happening to the entire solution. That's still important, um, but we're more concerned with what do the molecules look like before and after. So that's the sense that we're gonna use it for the most part um, until we get to certain catalysts, especially metals. Um, in organic chemistry, metals can be referred to as Lewis acids, um, and they can catalyze certain reactions by basically accepting electrons by bonding to um, lone pairs on a molecule, which makes those, mo those atoms more likely to give away their protons. So they can't hold their protons quite as tightly um, if they're bound to a metal atom. And so that's not a, a definition we're gonna see a lot yet, but I want you to, to remember that that is there. And the way I always remembered these is that bronsted lowry acid was the one that made sense. It's proton donor, proton acceptor. And still to this day, the way I think about Lewis acids is I have to go in my head and think to myself, Lewis acids are backwards because it's electrons. And so instead of being the proton donor, the acid is the electron receiver. So I just remember it as being the exact opposite of bronsted lowry acid, but meaning the same thing. Pro, switch proton for electron, switch donor for acceptor. It's like multiplying by negative one, except with particles. Um, and again, for the most part, we're gonna talk about Bronsted-Lowry, especially for right, for right now. And bases are the exact opposite. If the Bronsted-Lowry acid is the proton donor, Bronsted-Lowry base is a proton acceptor. Um, Lewis base is an electron donor. Arrhenius base just means you're increasing the concentration of hydroxide ions. So remember that in water, especially, H plus concentration or hydronium concentration and hydroxide concentration are inversely related to each other. Right? We had that equilibrium reaction where in water we would have some solution that, or some equilibrium that looked like if you had H2O plus H2O there was a again a finite probability that one of these waters could give away an H plus act as a Bronsted Lowry acid and the other water could act as a Bronsted Lowry base and accept the H plus and we would make H3O plus and hydroxide right and this is a reaction that doesn't happen all that often, but it happens in, in enough that we can measure it. And that's what the, our pH scale is based on. So remember that there was a K for this reaction we call KW, which is about 10 to the minus 14. And remember how equilibrium works. Where K is your concentration of your products times each other divided by your concentration of reactants. So if we, if we said, okay, starting from a concentration of zero for each of these, we did an ice table like you guys all remember and are having flashbacks to right now. Um, put X for both of these. If we solve for X, we wind up with a concentration of each of these being 10 to the minus seven, which you take the negative log of that and you get seven. So this is why a neutral solution in water has a pH of seven. Um, with uh, all the talk of Venus and phosphine gas and all that in life on other planets that's not based nearly as much around water, you could have very different acid-base chemistry happening. It would still be the same acid-base chemistry, but we wouldn't be talking about hydronium and hydroxide. Um, for instance, I think there's a moon around which is, is is it neptune or uranus it's uh right past saturn i always mix those two up 
us pizza. So it's Neptune. There's Neptune first and then Uranus. Um, there's liquid met or liquid ammonia is the common liquid form on on one of those moons. In liquid ammonia, if you had a solution where your where your solvent wasn't water, you could have a similar similar set of reactions happening, right? You would have ammonia reacting with ammonia in some equilibrium reaction to make ammonium and amide ion. And that's going to have a different K value. And so it's going to have, they would not be using a pH scale the same way we would be. Their pH scale would be very, very different. Or a pH scale based around a solvent that's not water would not be, a neutral solution would not be seven necessarily. A neutral solution in this case would be where these two compounds added up to zero. Or sorry, were multiplied to give you, together to give you K for that. Um, so just a reminder not to be quite so earth centric in our thinking. We have to be inclusive of other potential life forms on other planets as well. Um, no, it, it just, it really does change how we think about what's going on in these other planets. If you're interested in the astronomy side of things, it's worth remembering not everything has to be water-based, although that seems to be the most likely form forms of life would be water-based. But that's just also what's called the anthropomorphic principle, um, which is really interesting. It's the idea that we think life should look like us because we're here and we live. Our only experience with things that are living comes from things that evolved from on Earth. So we have a tendency to, um, I guess you consider it project projecting, um, project what we find to be hospitable to life um, onto other solar systems, but in theory there could be others. But we know life works on Earth, so we know that there's a possibility of life evolving where there's water. We don't know that there's a possibility of life evolving where there's ammonia as the, as the dominant liquid. All right, this is just going more review from GenChem. In fact, I think I just copy and pasted some of the slides from, from uh, 102, where we talk about acids and bases. Um, similar stuff, just rem reminding you of this vocab word, conjugate acid and conjugate base. Hey, Sean, I, do you mean to be screen sharing? Yes, I do. Thank you. All right. so. This, this term, conjugate acid, conjugate base, remember that is the, just our, um, our way of describing what, what's left after an acid-base reaction happens, right? So a conjugate acid is the base after it's accepted in H+, plus. or the conjugate base is the acid after it's lost in H plus. And so there are a couple of ways you can view this. Um, the, the simplest way, the way I usually teach this um, at first is the conjugate acid and conjugate base is what would happen if the reaction went backward. So if the acid is giving away the proton, the base is accepting the proton, the conjugate acid is what would be giving away the proton if it went backward. And the conjugate base is what would be accepting the proton if it went backward, which is helpful when we're trying to learn how these terms work, how to predict what's going on with these acid and base reactions. Um, but in organic chemistry, it's even more helpful to think of them as pairs. An acid will always have the same conjugate base and the base will always have the same conjugate acid. Because in this case, this would be nitrous acid turning into nitrite. When nitrous acid acts like an acid and gives away a proton, it always makes the same conjugate base. It always turns into nitrite. And when water acts as a base, it always turns into hydronium. So we can think, we 
we frequently will refer to these as acid-based pairs or conjugate acid-based pairs to mean that the molecules that are linked that are only different because they've been protonated or deprotonated. Right, so this, think back to last week's lab when we were talking about the acid-base extractions, we were going back and forth between those cases, right? We were talking about benzoic acid and then we were deprotonating it to make benzoate. And that, that pair, benzoate and benzoic acid, are a conjugate acid-base pair. And we can shift back and forth between those two states by changing the pH of the solution, right? By adding extra H pluses, we can take the benzoate and add H plus back and turn it back into its acidic form, its protonated form. Um, and so we're going to always be, anytime we have an acid base reaction in OCHEM, that's what we're looking for. Where are we going to be adding an H plus or where are we going to be losing an H plus from these molecules based on the conditions? And I think, let's take a break there and we'll come back and we'll practice with that and cement that in our head. So let's come back at, uh, I've got 902, I'll start talking again. So let's aim for nine and I'll start going from there. 
All right, so I've got these written up on the board. Let's start by just going through and label, labeling them as conjugate acid or as acid base, conjugate acid, conjugate base. So this part actually gets a little bit easier um, in organic chemistry because a lot of times in organic chemistry, it's really easy to see um, what molecules are on both sides and kind of pair them up. Um, in, in gem chem and in inorganic chemistry, it takes a little bit more practice, but it's really easy to see for this first one, you've got a, benz a molecule with a benzene ring on both sides. So regardless of whether it's the acid or the base, you know that this is paired with that molecule. It's the same molecule, just missing or with an extra H plus. Um, and we'll see this a lot in organic chemistry. Organic chemistry, we're not gonna focus very much on things like balancing reactions because almost all of our reactions are gonna wind up being one-to-one. -one. We can almost always point exactly to what molecule is on both sides of the reaction and say that we've got the same, you know, and say the same number of molecules. We're not gonna be dealing with weird stoichiometries for the most part. So maybe occasionally two to one. Maybe if it's a combustion reaction, we might have to do something but we're not even gonna spend much time on combustion reactions because combustion reactions are kind of boring in the ochem sense. They always make CO2 and water, right? Maybe with some byproducts if there was some nitrogen or some sulfur in the mix. So for the most part, we're always gonna be just trying to point out, okay, where, what molecules on each side and how are they linked? So in this case, like I said, we can point to our molecule with the benzene ring. Um, this is a molecule called phenol, P-H-E-N-O-L. And we'll talk about names here in, uh, in a chapter or two. Um, but anything that ends in O-L is almost always gonna be an alcohol. And P-H-E-N, it stands for a phenyl group which is different than phenol. Phenol is a benzene ring with an OH. A phenyl group with a YL means that we've got a benzene ring attached to something else. It's like phenylalanine is alanine with a benzene ring attached to it. So it's subtle difference, but I'm gonna to try to overpronounce them. So if it sounds like I'm saying it funny, it's because I'm trying to make it clear whether I'm saying phenol versus phenol. Um, and so in this case, we've got phenol, and then we've got the same molecule missing an H plus. We pulled an H plus off. We left all the electrons behind. So phenol is going to be the acid or base. Acid. Acid. Yeah, so the phenol is the acid because it's the molecule that's giving up an H plus when it's be, being deprotonated from the perspective of, the, of looking at the organic molecules. We're deprotonating phenol, which makes it the acid. The hydroxide is paired with the water here. So the hydroxide is going to be the base because it's accepting an H plus. And if phenol is the acid, the deprotonated form is the conjugate base. And if hydroxide is the base, water is the conjugate acid. And so the, I'm going to continue to use the, the terms protonated and deprotonated because I think that's a useful way to, to keep the focus on the specific molecule we're talking about. Is this molecule in the protonated state or the deprotonated state? Um, but acids and bases talking about this is the, the, it's going to act as an acid is basically just sort of flipping the frame of reference, right? I could, if I put, to use English terms, if, um, if you've had English 101 and you may have heard about the passive voice and how you're not supposed to use the passive voice, we do that in chemistry sometimes 
because um, we could say that phenol is acting as the acid or we can put phenol in the passive voice and say phenol is being deprotonated, make it the subject of the action rather than the, um, the, oh, that would, ah, now I've gotten beyond my depth in English, um, mixing up subject and predicate or something. I don't remember. Um, I know predicate's a word. That's about as far as it goes. Um, but it's just really a shift of the frame of reference is all right. From the perspective of the phenol versus um, perspective of what's happening to the phenol. So just know that those terms can be used somewhat interchangeably. How about down here? Which one's the acid, which one's the base? Your acid is the first one, your base is the second. Bingo. Yeah. In, in order to be, and here's a, a good clue, if, um, beyond just looking for what gained in H plus, um, you have to have lone pairs or a negative charge for it to be a base. You have to have a proton that it can give up in order for it to be an acid. And this isn't a molecule we'd look at this and say, look at it and say, easily say, oh, it's definitely got an H plus it could lose. None of these, when we talk about acidity here in a minute, none of these protons we would necessarily look at and say, you know, that's an acidic proton. That proton is going to be easy to pull off. Um, but if you have a strong enough base, we can actually force that to happen. And so picking which of the H pluses we're going to remove winds up being based on resonance and based on some other stability things we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so our nitrogen molecule winds up being our base to conjugate acid. And here's our acid and conjugate base. Also worth remembering that at equilibrium, we're always going to favor making weaker acid and base pair. So if we start with, with phenol and hydroxide, if, I, if we looked at numbers and we found out that the product side was favored by equilibrium, that would tell us that this deprotonated phenol is a weaker base than hydroxide is. Whichever side is favored at equilibrium is going to be the side where we have a weaker acid and a weaker base, right? Because that's, in, to put it in different terms, we're going towards the more stable side. If something is a really good acid or a really good base, that's because it's unstable in its original form. And it's trying to steal an H plus or give away an H plus in order to become more stable. So in this case, we would find that, that the product side is favored and we're going to be making the, this deprotonated phenol is going to be a weaker base than the hydroxide. And water is a weaker acid than phenol. And same down here, we're making a molecule it's not necessarily, we would not necessarily expect it to be all that stable, this conjugate base here, but it must be more stable. If, if equilibrium favors the product, this must be a weaker base than the deprotonated nitrogen. Or we could flip it around and say that this is a weaker acid than the protonated form here. John, can you explain why that is one more time on the bottom? So we wouldn't necessarily look at this molecule and think of it as being an acid. Like I said, there's no easy protons to look at and say, oh, that's definitely going to be the where um, a hydrogen that's easy to give away. But if you put it with a strong enough base, this is a really, deprotonated amines are really strong bases. They're really easy to protonate or flip that around. It's really good at pulling protons off of things to become this more stable form. 
So because if we look at the base and the conjugate base and compare them, if equilibrium favors making the products, if equilibrium says that these are more stable than over here, it must be because this is a weaker base than this is. And that's tied to the acids. It's not like we'd look at acid strength versus base strength. These are all in pairs, right? So we would we could say that this is a better base than, than the deprotonated form here. We could also say that this is a stronger acid than this molecule. But since neither of these is particularly good at being an acid, we would we would sort of focus on the base strength. Um, but that and that's something that you'll get a little more practice with and kind of. Um, and it wouldn't be wrong to say that this is a better acid than that. It's just that usually, since we wouldn't necessarily think of these, either of these as being acids, it's probably something going on between the bases. And you, so you would have to know um, which side is favored by the reaction. Right. And we will look at that on the next slide. So not, I don't expect you to be able to, to know that off the top of your head yet. Um, here we go. So this is sort of similar to the Ka charts that we may have seen in Gen Chem. Um, but it's a little bit different in that it's arranged not just by, by um, Ka, but by PKA. So similar to what we were doing, looking at last week in lab. Um, and it's also sort of arranged by different, we can kind of look at this in terms of different functional groups. Um, in, this has a bunch of actual specific molecules so that we can compare things, but we'll, we'll frequently see things in, in textbooks. Um, let me pull up the textbook real quick, where it's basically will give you like a really generic, okay, for any ketone, any protons that are adjacent to a ketone, um, this is going to be the range of Ka's that you might see. Um, so, but what this is going to allow is for us to, let me see if it actually does have examples, common functional groups, maybe at the front. Um, it frequently will be like just inside the cover on the textbook. Yeah, there we go. So this is a slightly more complicated looking version of the same type of chart um, where it kind of has things grouped by different functional group. So for instance, um, any anytime you've got an amine where you've got a nitrogen, a protonated amine, where you've got um, nitrogen attached to carbon, depending on what these different R groups are, um, you know, you can have different PKA values. So this one's not that easy to read because it's got a lot of information on it. But basically, you'd be looking in this range around 10 for any of these amines as far as them acting as an acid. Um, if we go back to the simpler version, this is, we're basically going for, for OCHEM, we're going, not going to use ice tables and do lots of, of um, calculations with Ka values, we will look at pKa basically as a way to judge which of those possible um, conjugate acids is going to be stronger. So anything that's got a high Ka value is going to be more basic, meaning it's going to be harder to pull the proton off of it. Anything that's that's got a low Ka val pKa value is going to be a very strong acid. It means it's really easy to to remove the H plus. So if you look down here at some of what we'd consider strong acids, anything that's considered a strong acid is going to have a pKa of less than zero. It's going to have a negative pKa value, because that's saying if you put it in water, it's going to it's going to give away its H plus more than half the time. Usually we would just say it's going to give away its proton almost all of the time. Um, so for hydrochloric acid, it's got a HCl has got a pKa of negative seven, um, which means if you put it in water, that 
for every 10 to the seven molecules you have, one of the HCLs will stay protonated. The other, the other molecules, 10, the other 10 to the seven molecules are all going to be deprotonated, are all gonna give away their H plus. So again, we just basically would say that 100% of the HCLs are going to be deprotonated. And same with sulfuric acid, it's str even stronger than HCL. Um, if we get down in here into the range where it's not a strong acid, we, get, we start seeing things that are a little bit more interesting in terms of the fact that they won't be 100% protonated or deprotonated. Um, and some of these are gonna, where we can kind of start to group them based on these, um, on these functional groups. So a carboxylic acid, this is acetic acid where you've got CH3 and then CO2 with an H attached, turning into acetate. Uh, it's gonna have a pKa of around 4.75. What that means is at a pH, at a pH that's more acidic than 4.75, most of our molecule will be protonated because more acidic means extra H plus is floating around. If we're at a pH that's greater than 4.75, we're missing H pluses. We don't have very many H pluses around, so we're more likely to find our molecule in the deprotonated form. This also means that we can compare these and say, okay, if we're looking at these two compounds, acetic acid versus this ketone, this diketone, this diketone actually does have an acidic proton it can give up, but it's a pretty weak acid. It doesn't give up that proton until you get up near a pH of nine. So that allow, would allow us to say, okay, between these two, acetic acid is the stronger acid because it has the lower pKa. It also allows us to do things like predict which side of a reaction is going to be favored at equilibrium. If I put these two compounds together, let's, let's just look at these acetic acid and um, we need the base form, the deprotonated form here. It's gonna allow us to predict which of these is going to be more stable, which side is going to be favored. So for instance, just for the sake of getting used to what all these different compounds look like. There's acetic acid written in sort of that Kakuli form. And if we look at the deprotonated, If we wanted to look at these, these two and see what would happen if we had these acting as acid in a base, if we had acetic acid acting as the acid, we would wind up making the deprotonated form. And on the other side, we wind up protonating that middle spot. We wind up with our overall charge being being the same for both sides. And so if we wanted to predict which of these sides is going to be favored at equilibrium, we could look at the Ka, the pKa's of the two acids. So for acetic acid, pKa was 4.75. For this diketone here, our pKa from this chart was 9.0. If we look at which of these is gonna be more acidic, it's the one with the lower K pKa value. So acetic acid is going to be a better acid than this diketone because it's got the lower pKa value. In other words, we're going to favor making this side of the reaction because that makes the weaker acid and the weaker base. We also flip this around and say that this is a pretty good base and, and the acetate is gonna be a pretty weak base. 
that's really just the inverse of saying that acetic acid is a stronger acid than the diketone. The conjugate base of the diketone is a better base than the conjugate base of acetic acid. Um, hey, Sean. Yeah. You said that the reagents were the more favorable side of the problem? The products would and be. The pro sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. The yeah. products to the more favorable and that's because they're more neutralized out yeah that's another it's you're closer to being neutral because both of these are weaker this is a weaker acid than the acid we started with this is a weaker base than the base we started with okay you mind if i ask a question not at all does the pKa value uh, change once you've gone from the acid to the conjugate base? Um, that's a good question. So the, the pKa does not change, but if you remove a second proton, that's going to have a different pKa value. It's not the pKa. So for instance, if we look at... Let's see if there's any good examples on here. Um, the example I'm looking for is not on there. We go back to the textbook. Um, if you look at these these protonated amines, these are what are what are referred to as quaternary amines because they've got four things attached to them. They all have a pKa value of around 10. But if you wanted to look at the pKa value for in a mean that did not, that was not protonated. It's not even on here. So that example doesn't work either. Um, no, there it is. PKA for things like taking a hydrogen off of an amine that's not charged is going to be up between 35 and 40, as opposed to being around 10. So if we think of it as being two different steps, We're looking at, um, so if we had, let's say just NH4 with a positive charge. And actually I'm gonna redraw that in the complete form. So if we had ammonium, nitrogen with four bonds, no lone pairs, so it's got a positive charge. That can be deprotonated to make ammonia. Which is now neutral, right? And the pKa for that process, so the pKa for ammonium is going to be around 10-ish. If you do that one, if you deprotonate it again to make what's known as the amide ion, that's going to have a pKa of around 40. So it's not so much that the pKa changes. It's just that you're going to have a different pKa for sequential reactions. If you've got more than one proton you can give up, um, then those are, those are two different reactions, right? This is one reaction. This is a separate reaction. So the pKa is a measurement of like what it takes to deprotonate something. Is there like a pKb? There is, and it's going to be the exact inverse. So pKa is how, how acidic something is. The lower pKa means it's very acidic. pKb is the negative log of Kb. And remember, we had definitions for these reactions, right? Ka was the equilibrium constant for this reaction, where you put water with your weak acid and you made hydronium. And um, 
the deprotonated form, and Ka was the equilibrium constant for that reaction for for your weak acid reacting with water. Kb is the equilibrium constant for a weak base interacting with water to make hydroxide and the protonated form of your weak base. So those are going to be related if you if you treat this if you treat the conjugate acid of your weak base as a weak acid you can get a Ka for it. So it's sort of the inverse if it's um, if we have a K, if your pKa is for deprotonating something, your your Kb is going to be for protonating the same thing for basically the reaction happening backward. That gets a little bit tricky to um, to juggle in your head, and since we're usually going to be dealing with measuring the acidity of a, of a solution rather than the basicity, we usually just stick with Ka values for deprotonating something rather than talking about the PK, PKB values for protonating something, because we don't work in POH, we work in pH. Um, but they're right. Thank you. going to be related, yeah. All right, so let's, So one of the ways that tables like this is, are useful is basically is going to allow us to look at the, the different possibilities for which protons might, get, might be more acidic than others by basically looking at what's around them and figuring out what's going to make things more acidic. And in general, things that are more acidic are going to be um protons that are next to that are next to electronegative elements if you have ways of pulling electron density away from a hydrogen that's going to make it easier to pull that hydrogen off because there's there's less electrons holding that h plus in place basically um, the other thing is if we can add more resonance by deprotonating something that's going to be favorable. So in this case, for this molecule, which would be propanolol, doesn't seem propranol, all. so that's a common name, not a systematic name. If we're trying to figure out which of these um, hydrogens might be more acidic, we're going to be looking for either hydrogens that are directly attached to electronegative elements or hydrogens that are next to electronegative elements. <clears throat> and if we start looking at this chart over here, so most, if we look at OHs, alcohols in general are going to be somewhere in the 16 to 18 range to deprotonate an OH group. If we looked at the nitrogen, Deep, it doesn't have a positive charge, so deprotonating a nitrogen is going to be all the way up in that 38 range. So out of those two possibilities, the OH versus the NH, the OH is going to be more acidic because, it, because looking on this chart, all of these OHs are in that same range between about 16 to 18. So out of those two options, the OH should be more likely to be deprotonated. So now it's just a question of, are the, any of these carbon-hydrogen bonds more acidic than an OH? So basically, are, they, are there any, is there anything higher on this chart than, than the alcohols? And we wind up seeing, if we had a hydrogen in between two ketones, that's fairly acidic, at least compared to an alcohol. If we had a carboxylic acid group, that's fairly acidic. But then we get into stuff that's all got positive charges or really easy to identify acidic protons. And we don't have any of that here. There's no positive charges here. Um, 
So our most acidic proton here is going to be the OH proton. If we if we put this with a really strong base and we're going to pull it in hydrogen off, it's going to be that hydrogen, right? Because that's the most acidic group on this whole molecule. And we would probably be in a pH of around 16 to 18, somewhere in there. Sean, can you repeat uh, what your second criteria was? If you have, so it's going to come down to either if you deprotonate it, you can add resonance structures, or it's if you have a hydrogen where it's all the electron density is being pulled away from it. If you have a hydrogen attached to a really electronegative element, that's going to be more acidic. And so hydrogens attached to oxygens are going to be more acidic than hydrogens attached to nitrogens if all the resonance stuff is identical. So let's look at a, a couple examples of that. Um, and this is what most of the rest of the slides have to deal with, but I'll use the whiteboard for now. Um, so if we have an alcohol versus an amine, they both have a hydrogen attached to an electronegative element. But in the case of the alcohol, the OH is more electronegative. The oxygen is more electronegative than the, than the nitrogen. More electronegative means better at pulling electron density towards itself, right? Worse at sharing. And if it's worse at sharing, that means that that hydrogen actually has less electrons that are keeping it attached. So we'd have a pKa of around 40 versus a pKa of around 17. So way more acidic. And if we see the same thing with, um, if we look at a carboxylic acid group, like acetic acid versus an amide group, which looks on the surface to be pretty similar. They both have a carbonyl right next to an electronegative element that's attached to hydrogen. And in both of these cases, we wind up with pKa here of 4.75, just since we just looked at that, I had that in my head still. And I have to go back and look at what the pKa is for the for the amide group, but it's going to be considerably higher. And I have to check the other one even because it's not even on there. It's going to be acidic, but it's going to be a lot less acidic because you've got that that hydrogen attached to a less electronegative element. And I actually have to just Google it. pKa of amides is about pKa of about 9.5. So to deprotonate this one, is going to be a lot harder than deprotonate where you have the hydrogen that's attached to an oxygen. And both of these, neither of these did I even consider the fact that you have, you have other protons on there, right? But they're attached to carbons, which are even less electronegative. So breaking a carbon-hydrogen bond 
deprotonating a carbon hydrogen bond is going to be even less likely than either of these other two for the most part. All right. Um, and if we go back to looking at some of these properties. Do you mind if I ask you a question? Not at all. Uh, what's the difference between a, a mide and a, a mean? And it seems like a pretty big difference in terms of proton donation. So that's a very good question. If we wanted to look at, and for, for both of these cases, right? And that's actually where I was headed next. So I have no problem just going to the board to talk about this. Um, if we look at the OH, here on an alcohol versus the OH for a carboxylic acid, there's a pretty giant jump in PKAs there. This one's 10 to the, was that 10 to the 12 times more acidic? And here we've got a jump of 10 to the 30 times more acidic. Um, the difference in these is that our second criteria is, is beyond just is the hydrogen attached to that electronegative element can we add a resonance structure when we deprotonate it? So in this case, we don't really have an easy resonance structure we can look at when it's protonated. But if you take the hydrogen off and put a negative charge here, we have a resonance structure we can draw. It would look like that, where you can basically switch the negative back between the two oxygens and share it. We don't have that for an alcohol. And same for the amines versus the amides. Amines have no resonance structure when they're deprotonated. Amides, if you put a negative charge here, that negative charge can resonate over and the oxygen can take that and you can resonate the negative charge back and forth between the nitrogen and the oxygen. So that's that second criteria that makes things more acidic is, is resonance. And sometimes we can make things more, resonance will tend to make things more acidic because it's usually easier to resonate a negative charge once you've deprotonated compared to, it's, it's hard to have more resonance structures when you protonate things. So compounds that are going to have more resonance are typically going to have more resonance when they're deprotonated because those, those electrons are not going to be stuck in a localized position like we were talking about with the problem at the beginning. If we, go, if we went all the way back there, we were looking at this molecule here. Um, if we protonated, if we added a proton here and we forced that nitrogen to be, that um, nitrogen's lone pair to be localized, that's going to, we're going to lose a resonance structure, right? So that means it's going to be kind of hard to do that. Or the flip side of, of saying it's going to be hard to protonate that lone pair is saying it's going to be easy to deprotonate that. If it was in the protonated form with the with the nitrogen or having the other hydrogen on there and a positive charge, all of the nitrogen's electrons are localized. But if we could get rid of one of those hydrogens, we'd be able to add a new resonance structure. So that makes this functional group pretty acidic because losing that H plus is a lot easier because we're going to add that resonance structure right so those are our main criteria for determining if you're if you don't have a table of pka values sitting in front of you and you're trying to figure out um which which molecule is going to be more acidic look for having things attached to electronegative elements and resonance which of them is going to have more resonance if it's deprotonated so this is the example we just did on the board. 
um, a review from last week and things we were talking about before when it comes to the pKa values. If we've got a pH of seven, would we expect most of the amines to be protonated or deprotonated? Protonated. And actually, protonated. And that's going to affect our solubility, right? Uh, oh, sorry, there is one other criteria. The larger an ion is, the more acidic it is. So if we were looking at um, hydroxide versus a, I'm even blanking on, on uh, sulfide ion, a hydrogen sulfide ion, which has a common name, but I'm blanking on it right now. Um, this molecule with the sulfur is going to be more stable than hydroxide is because that negative charge, because we have that extra layer of electrons, we're in the N equals three level instead of the N equals two level. Because we have that extra layer of electrons, that negative charge is spread out over a bigger area, which is always going to be more stable, just like with resonance. With resonance, the more you can spread the electrons out, the better. Same with these. They don't have resonance, but the larger ions, everything else being equal, the larger ions are going to be more um, stable. So if we had, uh, we'll, we'll do examples here in a second. And this is the example we just looked at. If we look at an alcohol, conjugate base versus the conjugate base of a carboxylic acid, the, car the charge is delocalized when we can have resonance, which means that it's going to be more stable versus if we, if we only have all sigma bonds, we don't have any resonance that can happen. This is going to be a lot. That charge has to be on the oxygen which means it's going to be a lot less stable than being able to spread it back and forth between two oxygens. Right, so a lot of times when we're looking at what's more acidic, it's not gonna be about what, what does it look like when it's protonated, it's gonna be what does it look like when it's deprotonated? What is it, is it going to get a whole lot more stable when you deprotonate it? It's not just looking at the molecule that you start with and being able to judge. You have to look at what that molecule would turn into once it loses a proton to determine what, what's going to be more stable. So let's do some practice here. If we've got a couple different options of what, what protons might be more acidic, how can we determine which is which? We said this top molecule, we're going to deprotonate it. Which of these hydrogens are we going to pull off? The blue one, because you could have resonance with the pi bond. So let's see what, let's draw what the structure would look like if we pulled that off. So when in doubt, start by drawing the product, the conjugate base. So if we pull off the blue proton, we would have this molecule, right? What would a resonance structure look like for that? I don't, I don't know. I'm kind of blanking. So we could move the charge there and move. Uh, no, we can't. We can't move the charge there, right? Because this carbon already has eight electrons. So we can't, I guess it could keep the pi electrons and we wind up making what would we wind up making? It doesn't even wind up looking very effective. Can we even do that? I don't think so. Charge there. Yeah, it's not looking very good, right? What if yeah. we put it in the remember that that for the most part we're going to see a lot more resonance in the allylic position if we put the negative charge up here 
now it starts looking right. If you start trying to draw resonance structures and it starts looking like everything's wonky and you can't figure out even what it would look like, you probably are doing it wrong or there isn't a resonance structure there. This one, on the other hand, a charge in the allylic position, we could wind up making it look like this. We wind up having three different resonance structures because then we could do it one more time. Put the negative charge over there, right? So we wind up with three different resonance structures if we deprotonate here. If we deprotonate from this position, you can't resonate this way because that, that carbon had, go back to the other structure here. If you have a negative charge here, you can't resonate towards this carbon up at the top because it's all sigma bonds. It seems like there should be some way we could draw a resonance structure. But if we do that, this carbon still has eight electrons, right? Which means we can't point these electrons towards two. That's why it doesn't work. Because if we drew just the one arrow, that one would look like a negative charge here and a negative charge there that still has the hydrogen attached as well. So in other words, this carbon has eight electrons already, so we can't move those pi electrons towards it. So having it in the allylic position winds up being really important rather than having the charge on the carbon that already has a pi bond. So to go back to the original question there was which of those two carbons is going to be more Where's my, there it goes. Um, more acidic. If we lose the red electron, we get three different resonance structures. If we lose the blue electron, we get no resonance structures. So we would expect the red proton to be way more acidic. And how about if we have oxygen and OH versus an NH? Neither of them with a charge. Would it be the OH? It would be the OH. Because it's more electronegative than nitrogen? Exactly. So, and to put it in the same context of thinking about what the products would look like, we have our two choices are deprotonate the oxygen and we get a negative charge on an oxygen, or we deprotonate the nitrogen and get a negative charge on the nitrogen. Push comes to shove we're always going to put a negative charge on the most electronegative element. As long as everything still has the full valence. That goes back to our what we were talking about at the beginning of possible resonance structures. Our other possibility would look like would look like this. If you got it into a basic enough solution, if you put it with a strong enough base, in theory you could do you could deprotonate both places and have a negative charge here and here, but you're going to deprotonate the oxygen first. And then last, last example. We have a, we could deprotonate a thiol, which is an SH group, or we could deprotonate an alcohol, an OH group. So the, the oxygen's more electronegative, but the sulfur is bigger. They're both in the same column of the periodic table, but the fact that the sulfur has an extra layer of electrons, we're in that, that N equals three layer for the level for the electrons, means it's gonna be easier to deprotonate the sulfur than the oxygen.
So if they're not in the same level of the periodic table, whichever one is bigger is going to get deprotonated first. If they're in the same level of the periodic table, which, whichever one's more electronegative gets deprotonated first. But the real kicker is the resonance. Whichever, whichever conjugate base gives you more resonance is going to be the proton that's deprotonated first. So you mean that's, that's like the most important criteria? Yes. And that's why we see such a giant difference in acidities when we have something with, that's got more, more resonance structure. We see this too, even with the, uh, go back to the table here. If you look at um, deprotonating phenol, like we talked about earlier, it's got a pH, a pKa of around 10 versus a normal alcohol would be a pH, pKa of around 16 to 18 that difference, that's a 10 to the six times more acidic. That's all gonna be due to the resonance because this negative charge, this structure here, the deprotonated phenol is gonna have a lot more different resonance structures because you can move that negative charge towards that carbon. You've got a negative charge in an allylic position. We actually call it a benzylic position, but it's same thing, right? Adjacent to some pi bonds there's a lot of resonance structures we can draw here. All right, we'll end there for today, or for, for lecture anyway. Um, for lab, um, it's going to be a lab you can you could work on on your own. Basically, we're going to be focusing on distillation today. Um, and distillation is one of those, one of those um, procedures that's really really pretty well understood. It's really used in industrial chemistry a lot for purification. Um, we're going to start today with simple distillations is what they're called, which is basically you heat a pot down here, you collect the vapor over here, and what comes out the other side is going to be higher in one component than another, right? So the same, same principle they use to make alcohol. Um, we'll get into, if, if not this quarter, the next quarter, fractional distillation, which is basically a way it, you can simulate doing a whole bunch of distillation steps all at once. Basically, you, every time your mixture evaporates and recondenses and then evaporates again, that's simulating a whole nother distillation. So if you give it a whole bunch of places to do that on its way to where you're going to collect it, you can wind up simulating, not simulating, it's the wrong word, but um, effectively doing 50 distillations in one step and, and get really pure stuff, which is what they do for hydrocarbons, for crude oil. When they process crude oil and turn it into all the other products they make, they run it through a fractional distillation where they're basically, everything that condenses at this temperature gets collected here. Everything that condenses at that temperature gets collected a little bit lower. Um, so we will, we'll, talk about the simple distillation. There's a Professor Dave video and a chapter from, a, from an OCHEM lab textbook. Um, if you have time between now and then to start working on it. Um, you know, the Professor Dave video is pretty short. And then there's the packet of reading looks long, it says 12 pages, but a whole bunch of those are figures. And I think it's kind of interesting because it talks about historically what alchemists, the glass where the alchemists would use to do distillation in the, you know, in the 1400s, which is kind of cool. Um, and uh, we'll talk about it. Talk about it in lab at three thirty. That's when I see you next. All right. All right. I will see you guys then. Bye, guys. Thanks. See you.